السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد Welcome to the tenth episode of a story and an ayah Today إن شاء الله I would like to share with you two verses from Surah At-Tawbah and they are verses 101, 102 and 103 Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in these verses he says And then in verse 103 Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says so the interpretation of these verses is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says There are others who have acknowledged their sins, they admitted their sins They have mixed righteous deeds with bad deeds Perhaps Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might turn to them in forgiveness Indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is forgiving and merciful before I continue, I would like to put some point out something that is very beneficial, inshallah, over here. Whenever you see in the Quran the word Asallahu, perhaps Allah, and I know it turns out as perhaps, but Asallah over here, the scholars tell you that whatever comes after it, it means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will do it. It's not perhaps or maybe. No, it means Asallah means Allah will do it. And this is from the generosity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in the context of this ayah over here, it means that perhaps Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive him. It means that he will subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive them. The second verse, خُذْ مِنْ أَمْوَالِهِمْ صَدَقَةً تُطَهِّرُمْ وَتُزَكِّيهِمْ بِهَا Take from their wealth a charity that by which you would purify them and increase them. وَصَلِّ عَلَيْهِمْ And invoke Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's blessing upon them. Make dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive them. إِنَّ صَلَاتِكَ سَكَنٌ لَهُمْ Your invocation, your dua is a source of reassurance for them. It's a source of tranquility for them. وَاللَّهُ سَمِيعٌ عَلِيمٌ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is hearing and knowing. So what is the story behind these two verses? Let me give you a bit of a context of a background so you can better understand the story behind these two verses. So this has to do with the time of the Prophet ﷺ when he was in Medina, when he had received news of the Byzantine Empire that they have gathered a huge army to attack the Muslims. So the Prophet ﷺ, rather than wait until the army reaches Medina, he decided to order the Muslims to go out to meet them in a military expedition. So the Prophet ﷺ, in a summary day, a day that is extremely hot, in a time where the people of Medina were suffering from some of the lack of nutrients and food and crops, he had ordered them to prepare themselves for this long travel journey. Now this was a time of hardship for them. They didn't even have enough sustenance to take them throughout this whole journey, enough food and supplies for them for the entire journey back and forth. And so some of the companions of Allah Anhum they tried their best to prepare for this, but they all had a bit of a shorthand in being unable to provide for themselves. But still, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had ordered us to obey the, law, Allah, the Prophet sallallahu And so they intended to obey the Prophet sallallahu So he had ordered them to gather and let's leave. In Medina, there were also people who were considered munafiqeen, hypocrites. What this means is that they outwardly profess Islam. Outwardly, they claim to be Muslims, but inwardly, in reality, they're harboring disbelief, they're harboring hatreds to Allah and His Messenger, but they don't outwardly say it. So those munafiqeen, when the Prophet wasallam had ordered the companions to gather and go, they sought it as an opportunity, and they do this quite often whenever they had the chance to disobey Allah and His Messenger, they would do it because they don't want to do anything for Allah and His Messenger, including going out in a military expedition that is far, far away. And so they they said their, to their people who are also hypocrites, لا تنفروا في الحر Do not go out in the heat, stay behind. And so many of the munafiqeen, they did not go out in this expedition and they stayed behind. And so Surah At-Tawbah came to expose them to the Muslims who they really are or what their qualities are, to expose the munafiqeen about the reality of what they harbor inside of them. And so many of the people who had stayed behind were in fact munafiqeen. However, there were some Muslims who were truly Muslims, they did stay behind. 
And it's not that because they were hypocrites, but it's because they were distracted by worldly benefits or they were distracted by worldly gains that they told themselves, I will follow the Prophet ﷺ in a day. Let me just finish this and I will go out and follow the army. And sure enough, the Prophet ﷺ on his way back when they heard news, those individuals, they realized the grave error and, error and mistake and sin they had fallen into, that they disobeyed the Prophet ﷺ. They allowed worldly benefits and gains make them disobey Allah and his messenger. So what did they do? This is what these two verses have to do with. So it was mentioned that a handful of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, among them was a person named Abu Lubaba, when they realized what an error they have committed, what a huge thing that they have done. They disobeyed Allah and the messenger. And what's their excuse? They really, they have no valid excuse. It was worldly gains and benefits that they that made them disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger. So they said, we are not going to leave this without doing something and so they decided that they would tie themselves and chain themselves to the poles of the masjid of the prophet so they shackled themselves in there and they said we will not release ourselves until the prophet is has forgiven us until allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forgiven us and so the prophet once he returned from the expedition quite often as he always does he, after a journey, the Prophet ﷺ would pass by the masjid first. As he was passing, he saw these individuals sitting, tying themselves to a pole. And he said, what's wrong with these people? Who are these individuals? And so they were told that Abu Lubaba and a handful of his friends, they did not go out on the expedition. And they had promised and they swore not to unshackle those chains until you, Messenger of Allah, forgive them and you unshackle them. And so the Prophet ﷺ did not say anything and he waited for revelation. He said, I will not do it until Allah permits me. And so sure enough, the verses from the Quran, first verse 102 in Surah Tawbah was revealed, and others, they have admitted their mistakes. They admitted their sins. Like Abu Lubaba and those handfuls of companions, they realized what they did, and so they did not try to hide it from the Prophet. Many of the other hypocrites, when the Prophet came back, they started fabricating excuses. This is our excuse. But these individuals, they were true Muslims, they admitted their mistakes. They did not try to find an excuse or way out of it, but they admitted it. And so they have mixed good deeds and bad deeds. The good deed was the repentance and the bad deed was disobeying Allah and His Messenger and not going on to that expedition. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in that verse, Asa Allah an yatub alayhim. Perhaps Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might uh, forgive them. Wallahu ghafu inna Allah ghafu rahim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sure, is forgiving, all forgiving, all merciful. And so the Prophet ﷺ, when he re received this verse from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he had informed them that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had forgiven you. But Abu Rubaba still refused to unshackle his chain until the Prophet ﷺ would release him with his own blessed hands. Because he wanted to be rest assured. He wanted to be calmed down and confirm that the Prophet ﷺ truly has forgiven him and that Allah has forgiven him. And so the Prophet ﷺ, sure enough, went there and with his blessed hands, he removed the shackles from Abu Rubaba. Is that the end of the story? No, it isn't. Abu al is still not content. And so he decided, I want to do something that will make sure that my sin has been cleansed. So him and some of his uh, people that were with him that were tied together, they took some of their wealth and they came to the Prophet and they said, it is this world that has distracted us, that made us disobey you. Take for our wealth as a charity. But the Prophet once again refused. He said, not until Allah orders me. And then the next verse came down, which is verse number 103. It orders the Prophet to min amwalihim biha. Take from their wealth a charity by which it would purify them, that it would elevate them in ranks, that it would elevate them in reward. And so Allah even ordered the Prophet to go further. Make dua for them. Verily, your dua is a source of reassurance, tranquility for them. It will calm them down. Wallahu Samir Alim. Allah is all hearing and all knowledgeable. That is the story behind those two verses. But what are some of the lessons we can learn? Well, for one, we can over here learn that it's very important for us not to let the worldly pleasures or gains prevent us from obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Messenger of Allah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should be the most important things in our lives. They should be the most beloved things to us. So much that we would not allow anything to prevent us 
from obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger, including worldly things. These companions of Allah over here, they realize what happened. They realize that the worldly gains prevented them from following the Prophet sallallahu And so they realize the importance of this lesson that they should never do this again. We know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's commands and the commands of the Messenger of Allah, they all come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the most wise and the most knowledgeable. And so we need to rest assured that all of Allah's commands and all of His provisions have an important purpose and wisdom. And that's to bring for us all that is good for us in this world and the hereafter. And at the same time, prevent all that is bad for us in this world and the hereafter. And this, if we understand this, it will allow us to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It will make it easy for us to obey His orders, even when it conflicts with some of our desires. It means that whatever we desire this moment will lead us astray from and away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm sure didn't do that. But as human beings, obviously, we might make mistakes. We might be deceived by this world. Its glamour might distract us, and it might convince us to disobey Allah and His Messenger. And if this happens, what should we do? That's the second lesson. We should never ever make excuses for ourselves, but rather we should admit our mistakes. We should admit our sins. This is important because admitting our sin is the gateway to repentance. It enables us to go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and say, Oh Allah, I admit my mistake. Forgive me. Because repentance has prerequisites and there are conditions and there's three of them the first and most important of them is that we regret we regret our sin we regret our mistake and without admitting it how can we regret it so that is the first prerequisite the second is that we have an intention to never go back to that mistake and the third is that we stop that sin immediately and so when we admit our mistake and we admit our sin it enables us to do all these three things because then if we try to make excuses, really that blocks us from going back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It blocks us from asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us. And so this is the second lesson we can learn. The third lesson, inshallah, we can learn from this story is that if we ever fall into mistakes, one of the best things we can do to cleanse our sins is to give in charity. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had mentioned this in the Quran over here to take this charity from them. But it also in other places in the Quran and also from the teachings of the Prophet ﷺ, it's ingrained. For example, the Prophet ﷺ said, and he was teaching one of the companions, he told him, and follow the bad deed, and follow the bad deed with a good deed, it will erase that bad deed. And charity obviously is a good deed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran said, Inna al sayyat. Verily, the good deeds they eliminate. They dissolve away the bad deeds. And so one of the best things we can do is give in charity. If we ever do a mistake, we first, after acknowledging it and admitting it and asking for forgiveness, we can give in charity so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would eliminate that sin. The last thing I'm going to mention, inshallah, hopefully, inshallah, if anything, I want you to take this from you, uh, from this lecture, inshallah, or from this few quick minutes. These two verses are really are a message of hope. That even though we might have a mixed bag of good deeds and bad deeds, as long as we are admitting our mistakes, as long as we admit our mistakes and seek forgiveness, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive us. It's a beautiful message of hope. We should never ever lose hope in the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's important for us to remember this every single day, especially in Ramadan. Because Ramadan is the month of forgiveness. It's an opportunity for us to better our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to mend our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to improve that relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The month of Ramadan, subhanAllah, it's almost as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created it to make it an atmosphere that is conducive for that forgiveness. An atmosphere that's conducive for us to turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to think about ourselves and realize if we have done something wrong or not. I want you to think about Ramadan for a second. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chained the devils, which means that their ability to, to, to affect us has been reduced. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has legislated fasting. Fasting, what it does, it lowers our desires, the intensive desires of this world. So that push to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that attraction that we find in this world is also reduced. The fact that there are more acts of worship 
more prayers and reading of Quran, what it does, it cleanses our sins and increases our rewards. So consequently, it increases our level of Iman. It brings us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The gates of hell are closed. The gates of Jannah are opening, meaning this is an immense mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He will forgive our sins. The entire atmosphere of Ramadan is made for us to go back to Him, to turn to Him subhanahu wa ta'ala in repentance, to stop and think and acknowledge our mistakes. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among those who win the favor of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala during the month of Ramadan so that we would attain a forgiveness that unshackles us from the chain of hell so that we would be able to soar to the highest levels of heaven. Jazakumullah khair, subhanakallah bihamdik, ashad al-ant, astaghfiruka, wa atubu ilayk, wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.